Hi everyone and welcome to today's Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series webinar. Thank you for joining us. This is, we're about to complete the first month of our weekly webinars, so we hope you've enjoyed the higher frequency we're continuing the BITS program with this year. For those of you who just joined us, please remember to set up your audio. You can do this by going to Tools, Audio, and the Audio Setup Wizard. This will give you optimal, optimal levels for hearing our presenters today. For those of you who are new to the Blackboard Collaborate technology, I'd like to take a few minutes to walk you through the interface. The top left panel is your audio video panel. The next one below that lists the participants and the session interactions. And then below that is the chat if you have a question that you would like to ask. Periodically, we'll ask if you would like to vote. You can do this by using the drop down in the participant channel. So right now, I'm going to ask if everyone could give me a green check mark if they can hear my audio. Perfect. I see a lot of green check marks coming through. So thank you for that. When Misty kicks off the presentation, she's going to have a few pool questions. So we'll be using this same feature in a few minutes. Also, we'll get a lot of questions during this webinar. To ask your question, please use the chat box, and the moderators will answer your questions as soon as they can when they're not presenting. If there's time, we'll also ask your questions during the presentation and try to get to them at the end of the presentation during our Q&A portion. If you have a question, please enter it in the chat box with a Q and a colon. This will help us identify those that have questions versus those that are just having comments. Also, if the chat is happening at a high frequency, you can detach your panel by clicking on the arrow at the top and enlarging it to fit your needs. I'm Lauren Krasnerick, your session facilitator today. You've probably seen some of my colleagues if you attended any of our other BITS webinars. And our solutions engineer and product expert and today's presenter is Misty Cobb, who is helping with all of the BITS webinars. So today is getting started with publisher content with Misty Cobb and Brian Morgan from Marshall University. I'll introduce them on the next slide. This also lists some of our upcoming programs, and you can register for all of these at blackboard.com backslash bits. So our presenters today are Misty Cobb and Brian Morgan. I'll start with Brian. Brian is an associate professor and program coordinator for the Integrated Science and Technology Department at Marshall University, which is located in Huntington, West Virginia. Brian has also been a Blackboard Ask the Doctor. Misty is our solutions engineer for North American Higher Ed for Blackboard Learn. She's also a former director of distance education at Jacksonville State University. Misty holds a BS in computer science and MBA from Jacksonville State. And also, she's working on her doctorate in higher ed administration. So we have two talented presenters today to help you get started with publisher content. So now I'm going to kick it over to Misty, who will start off your presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren. And if you all will just confirm once again that you're able to hear me by giving me a green check mark, please. Thank you so very much. All right, so we're going to begin our time together today with a question. So Lauren, if you would change the poll top for me, please. And the question is, what type of content do you use? Choice A, publisher content, B, free resources, C, self-authored, or D, more than one of the above. If you will, use the polling tool to go ahead and select your answer choice. And we'll publish these responses to the whiteboard. I'll publish them for you, Misty. All right. Thank you, Lauren. So that's outstanding. So um, almost half of you are using uh, at least more than one of the above. So that's really great. OK, let's go ahead and take a look at the next question. Do you use one of the Blackboard Publisher integrations? 
So a green check mark if you are, please, and a red X if not. Just a couple of more seconds um, so that everyone has time to reply. All right. So it's almost almost um, half of you are not, and about 30% of you are. So hopefully this will be informative um, for all of you today. So let's go ahead and and get started. So back in the spring 2012 semester. Blackboard got together with O'Donnell and Associates and conducted both qualitative and quantitative research of digital behavior and perceptions. And this was done through about five focus groups with faculty in business, math, science, humanities, and social sciences. Um, a survey was emailed to over 8,500 faculty in late April, and we ended up with a just over 400, um, 427 responses. I do want to note that the study was not blind, so there could be some self-selection um, by faculty who are familiar with Blackboard, but nonetheless, I think the uh, findings that I'm going to share with you are pretty interesting. So the um, executive overview, if you will, in terms of findings will be that most faculty really consider themselves to be comfortable with technology. Most of them have incorporated digital content of some type into their classes for about two years or more now. And digital content uh, was defined broadly from posting a syllabus to those who are actually creating their own digital content. Today, most faculty are early in their migration with posting and communicating being prominent and with fewer, uh, not very many at all, actually creating their own materials. Instructors are using many sources for content, both print and digital. This ranges from textbooks to materials shared with the institution, course packs of material that some faculty compile, web applets, publishers digital learning systems, open education courses, so on and so forth. Search engines were noted as being one of the greatest sources for finding content. Uh, publisher systems were used in homework intensive courses. And faculty behave differently in course areas and course levels, and we'll talk about that in, in hopefully later today as time permits. And then incorporating digital resources enables the professor to really customize his or her course needs and to control the content, even in courses that are heavily reliant on commercial resources where instructors may tailor their assignments or presentation to achieve specific course goals, and then they may want to share that content with others at their institution. So this is an image that we created to illustrate the progression or migration to digital content that faculty described through this research process. And I'm going to spend just a couple of moments on each one of these phases. So the first phase that I want to talk about is post. And nearly three-fourths of the faculty respondents use technology to post the syllabus, course announcements, and other types of content. So this is basically using the learning management system to post what used to be provided in course handouts. And this, of course, may also include uh, links to different websites and resources that faculty may want to provide to their students. The next phase is curate. And as I described earlier, um, many instructors bring in content that they have curated from the web page, uh, from the web in general, to encourage students uh, and illustrate concepts or to help bring concepts to life, and even to take a deeper dive into specific topics. Curating can also mean compiling course packs of articles, cases, other materials. And this generally included a mix of both free and commercial materials. Finally, faculty curate content in the publisher's digital learning system, spending a lot of time culling through them to create their own assignments. Um, but we found that it was instructors were commenting that searching for content on the web is really time consuming. That was one comment that really came clear. 
The next phase is interact or interacting around the context. Uh, the content. So science instructors, for example, will ask their students to go to the web and find animations or simulations showing DNA replication. Then in class, the instructor would lead a discussion about which examples are better or more accurate or why. Um, so there are different ways that you can incorporate a variety of schools. I've seen individuals ask for students to post ideas to a class blog where the class would review the blogs and maybe comment on those and then they would bring in the discussion board to, um, to complement the work that was done in the blog so they collaborate and then have a time of reflection, if you will, through the different tools that are provided inside of Blackboard. So as they get comfortable, instructors use the publisher systems um, they begin to interact for tracking progress, adjusting their lecture times based on what homework may have been included, how students performed on the homework. They may also use uh, publisher systems to provide individualized instruction, remediation, practice for exams, so on and so forth. And then finally, um, you're able to share digital materials with colleagues on campus and at other schools through some of the different integrations. Um, something that we probably won't have time to dive deeply into today. We may not even get to touch on it at all, perhaps in a future session. But this will be, I believe, really changed and will enable faculty to um, participate more deeply in the interact phase through a functionality that Blackboard is providing via a tool and function called Explore. So that's a little teaser. We might can provide you with more information on that later. And then finally, albeit it is a small group, there is um, a group of faculty who are building their own materials and into our courses. And again, the builders are a small minority today. They do have a loud voice. And typically, they are the professor that is the closest to the instructional technology team on campuses. As more and more faculty move up this progression, you'll find that more faculty are moving into the building phase although we don't expect this to be a majority anytime soon because it is very labor intensive to create an entire course. So again, 80% are in the post phase and, then and are considered casual users, whereas 20% can be found across the curate, interact, and build phases, and those 20% are more or less considered to be power users. All right, so we are working on different ways that we can help you to take advantage of these tools and make it easy for you to utilize this content inside of your own courses. So here at the top, you will see that we have commercial content. Um, Brian is going to do a demo for you, and I'm going to share um, some additional information, and if time permits, I can also do a little bit of a demo for you. We also have open education resources that are available, um, Khan Academy and Merlot. There is a Merlot building block for Blackboard, if you are not familiar with that. Um, Khan Academy is also something that's going to be included inside of Explore. And Creative Commons is a feature that we are including in Explore so that faculty who choose to author content can do so and then utilize the Creative Commons licensure options for being able to share that content with their peers and colleagues. Next, there's user-generated content. Um, you may be taking advantage of some of this today, especially through Blackboard's mashup tool, namely through Flickr, YouTube, and SlideShare. And then, of course, being able to load in your own PowerPoint slides, PDF, and Word documents. Your institution may even have um, the ability to do Kaltura and NBC Learn if your um, institution licenses those building blocks. And then, as I mentioned before, you do have a course tools that include the mashups that I just mentioned. And I hope that you're taking advantage of wikis, blogs, and journals, um, as well as the discussion boards and then the grade sync tools that are available inside of most of the commercial content providers. 
So I want to make sure that we equip you um, and and you are able to get help if you decide that you want to take advantage of these additional resources, depending on what your institution uh, may be providing for you. So if you were to um, take your browser and navigate to the ondemand.blackboard.com slash understand URL, this will get you to the faculty view. Um, you'll come to the top and then you'll notice there is a jump to section and I've circled here content partners. This will drop you down to the area and the page so that you can find additional resources for being able to get started and take advantage of content that's provided by McGraw-Hill, Pearson, um, beneath this, I wasn't able to fit it all in on one screenshot, Cengage, uh, Wiley Plus, and other content providers. You'll notice that there are a variety of videos here to assist you um, in your endeavors to take advantage of this content. And then right before I'm ready to pass to Brian for his presentation, I, I would be remiss if I did not also make sure that I'm pointing you to the faculty success page. There you'll find uh, links to the on-demand learning center that I just mentioned, but much more. Also want to make sure that you are aware of the educator cohort. And, uh, and then again, um, just resources for you and your students. There is a wealth of knowledge on both the On-Demand Learning Center and Blackboard Help for both you and your students. So for the time being, I'm going to go ahead and pass to Brian. I uh, wanted to give you a perspective today about uh, what I've done with published content and uh, tell you the goods and the bads of uh, what I see and also some of the information from students. Uh, I asked some of the students what they thought about uh, uh, content as well. So it would be kind of interesting along the way. Um, first of all, I teach computer IT, again, uh, e-commerce, database design, programming, uh, both in 100% online and also uh, in the traditional classroom. I've actually been using uh, online tools such as WebCT and Blackboard since their inception back in uh, late 1996. And I was one of the ones who used to build my own content and start from scratch for every course. And as Missy alluded to, very time consuming. And uh, so now I have uh, large classes, large number of students, and a large load. And a few years back, I started looking, well, how can I do this a little bit differently so I don't have to spend you know, a great amount of time in the beginning, but still be able to customize the content. And I was able to do that by looking at uh, textbooks from Course Technology or Cengage Learning and uh, was able to see what they had available. And what uh, I have used is from their instructor resources that come with books, um, you know, pre-developed uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, but you'll see the slide that, that I mentioned a lot of this, that, but edited. Uh, they also have great resources for test banks that can be imported directly into Blackboard. Uh, I've used those before, but again, edited. And you'll see why I mention this a little bit later when we talk about some of the caveats and the do's and don'ts and some of the uh, students' perspectives as well. So what I have not done is I've never gone out and dropped in a course cartridge or uploaded pre-developed content and just walked away. Uh, in other words, no using uh, published content straight from the publisher without modification. And the reason I did that is in a former life, I was an instructional technologist. And um, pre-developed content is great, but uh, at the same time can really bore a student and, and turn them off of your course uh, very quickly. I just do want to make note that uh, there is a new resource available from Cengage Learning called MindTap. And I was able to take a look at it, oh, a few weeks back and uh, contemplating integrating it into one of my courses this fall that I teach with one of the books uh, from Cengage. And uh, it's fairly new and provides reading, multimedia assignments, uh, is easily integrated into, into uh, Blackboard. And um, so I haven't done it yet, but I want to get into that type of thing uh, to use. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great way to add some colorful content to your courses without, uh, without uh, disturbing you know, the overall mission of a course. So why publish your content? And this is strictly my opinion. Um, it's a great way to get started with content in Blackboard. Uh, why did I move away from developing all the content on my own? Because as Missy said, it takes some time. 
And uh, I like being a power user, but at the same time, I like doing my job and, and spending some time with the kids. And uh, what I was finding is, is doing it all on my own. I, I was losing part of that time at home, so I'd always go home and try to do new stuff and build. And uh, so what publishing content allows me to do is, is have a great solid basis from which to build. And there are plenty of examples that are already formatted in so many different ways and so many things to choose from for different uh, learning management systems. And uh, as I alluded to at the beginning, two of the most common that I use are test banks and notes. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I always go out and I build my own custom assignments for classes, and I have my own rationale for doing that. Uh, basically, the, the, the lead rationale is, is to cut down on people's ability to go out and be able to um, to copy solutions from the internet from things that already existed. And so that's one thing to you know to be aware of if there are uh, you know 20, 30, 40, 200 courses using. Uh, the same assignments, uh, ultimately those solutions are going to get out there. So that, it just takes a way of thinking when you're putting your course together on um, on how to do things. It's also a great supplement to uh, classroom content. Uh, I go into my classes every day, uh, tell students that they need to read ahead, and uh, in a, you know that's a challenge in and of itself. Sorry, it's kind of a, a personal joke of mine with students, but they can all read, and so if I can get them to read ahead. And if they read the chapter coming in, I have the notes in Blackboard, and they can always sit there. I teach in Computer Labs for all my courses, and they can always sit and look uh, and go through the notes with me. Uh, a lot of those are the pre-developed content. But what they don't have is, is what they do in class is we do examples. So if I'm doing a database class, uh, I base an example on the notes we're reading, so we'll build a database design, build some SQL statements in class. And uh, having a vehicle like Blackboard uh, handy with the notes already there, and it makes an easy addition to the content or a bulletin board post uh, to follow up with. Um, one note here I have is can be misused and not done properly. Uh, and that's one reason that I've never gone in and just uploaded a bunch of pre-developed content and walked away. Um, personally, know some faculty members who have done that, and I've seen it done. Uh, students have come to me and showed me content like that. And honestly, they're not sure where to go. Think about publisher content. It's developed for the masses, but not everyone teaches with the same style. So if a student uh, goes along and has Professor X for a semester, and then they have Professor X for the next semester, they got used to their, their style of teaching and what they expect the first semester. But then if they have some uh, pre-developed content the second semester, which they didn't have before, it probably doesn't resemble how Professor X teaches. And so the student will spend a lot of time muddling around trying to figure out what goes with what Professor X is speaking about. And when that happens, they're losing the whole point of the course. And the whole point of the course is, you know, it's just to receive information to learn. And so that's what they can be misused and not done properly. If Professor X uses pre-developed content and then modifies it to their style, uh, then it's a win-win for both. Why not publish your content? Um, I've heard this spoken before, and I'm not going to say where, and thankfully not at my institution, but I've been asked to do some things for other people before and, and been asked my opinion. And a comment that came up one time is we want to get an online program up and running uh, by next year uh, for, or for fall, and this might be you know December of the previous year. So they have eight months. And so I caution them, but one of the comments one time was, well, can't we just go out and buy a bunch of publisher content and throw it out there and make it all of our courses? Sure, you could, but you want to fail. And uh, I tried to explain to that school why. And uh, I know they didn't do this, thankfully. Um, they listened. But I don't see published content as a replacement for instructors. And that's what this school wanted to do at one point was, was get about 30 courses online real, real quick. And uh, real, real quick usually doesn't mean good quality. Not saying the content would not have been good quality because what I've seen and what I've used has been but it's not a great way to get stuff out there and uh, and get it up and running quickly. You still have to take some time. You still have to know the content. And uh, that's the key that, that I talk to instructors about is, you know, just copy and paste and won't work, but thoroughly understand the content, modify it to your style is the way to go. Um, from a student view, uh, courses where nothing but publisher content is used for their lectures, assignments, and tests, those, those exist. Uh, students have shown me this, and again, these are all uh, things that have been brought to my attention over the last uh, couple weeks in, in talking to students. Um, one student actually told me they felt they were paying someone to read them and not getting to the actual instruction. 
And um, the reason they were doing that is I guess they would go in and the content would simply be read chapter one, um, do the assignment. Well, what appeared to them, publish your content, I guess wasn't. This was what an instructor had posted, read chapter one, do the assignment at the end, whatever. Uh, even if that was something published content, that might not be a good example. But what I've seen so far, or from my uses, is, is it might you, you might be able to say at the beginning, read chapter one, but then it's going to have some at least a PowerPoint, a PDF, or something showing the highlights of chapter one. Uh, the pre-developed content I've seen has you know instructor editions where it says, hey, you might want to lead a focus on this. You might want to you know concentrate on this topic. Here's some examples. Here's some diagrams that you'd include on, in your Blackboard space that you know to, to convey further meaning that aren't in the textbook. And those are what an instructor has to take advantage of. Um, some faculty don't know actually don't publish content in. They don't even know what they're relaying or what questions are on the test. And um, it's frankly kind of embarrassing to, to see that happen. Is that students would come and say, hey, you know, uh, here's a question on this test and we never covered this. You know, what's going on? And, uh, you know, talk to a faculty member and say, hey, you know, what is this question? And they don't even know. You, you see a blank look. So, Go through and, and understand that you know a test bank may have 1,500 questions, but of course you're not going to offer 1,500 questions on a test. Um, some faculty have heard said, "Hey, but that guarantees randomization. If I pick 50 at random from the 1,500, we're going to guarantee you know that every student gets a random set of questions." Maybe so, but are you doing students a service by doing this? Um, this was one of the quotes that a student just told me um, Friday when I told him I was putting together this presentation and getting ready for this uh, talk. I want to earn my degree by learning from the professors here at Marshall University and not from the writers at McGraw Hill or, Hill or Pearson. And again, I'm not sitting here bashing publisher content, not at all. I use it. I like it. It's great for courses. And you can see the studies that, you know, the results of the study, what, what Misty was talking about earlier. But again, it's all about how you approach it. Okay. And I have had so many problems today getting set up and getting going that that uh, collaborator crashed on me three times getting set up with my Java. I was going to show just a little bit of what I do, and of course I'm really scared to kind of to click out and and see what's going on. So I'm not going to do that. But uh, feel free to ask any questions that that you might want to uh, to have answered. Um, how to and how not to use published content, just kind of a summary, more or less is uh, how to use it uh, as supplementary material. Uh, I love going in the classroom, being able to give examples, talk, answer questions. Uh, you know, face-to-face -face time for um, for students nowadays, you know, we're limited to two and a half hours uh, a week instruction for a three-hour semester class. And, you know, having a class of, say, 29 for my intro to C++ class this semester, I would much rather them come to class and ask questions and show them examples so that they can go out and read what's online and get a better feel for what they should be concentrating on and bringing, you know, and, and so they know what to ask and what to, what to work on outside of class. And uh, using publisher content is, is a great way to do this because usually, for example, the C++ comes with notes, comes with examples that they can work through on their own. Um, I often make references to the content. So if I am lecturing or if I'm giving examples, say, hey, you know, this is out there on Blackboard. Uh, check out under chapter one notes, probably in the range slide 10 to 20. Um, so knowing your content, uh, again, makes this a very valuable tool so that you can make references what is uh, outside the classroom or available to them afterwards. Use your own words. Uh, most of the publisher content that I've seen allows you to make edits. And this goes back to the teaching styles, uh, the way you convey information to your students. Uh, not everybody speaks the same way I do. Uh, not everybody speaks the same way you do, but by being able to edit what is there, it can make the students more comfortable uh, knowing that they can relate the content to you. Also, again, know your way around the material. Uh, don't just post it and expect students to find it. Uh, students won't, if there is any confusion whatsoever that's going to turn them off, they're going to be upset. Um, they're going to be sitting in your chairman's office griping. Um, I am the chair of our department now. And it's funny seeing both sides. So kind of going up through the ranks, used to be a web CT administrator, then a structural uh, technologist. So a faculty member, now chair. So I've seen it for, or from every single perspective under the sun. Ask for instructional design assistance. Uh, I know at our university, we have uh, a great team of instructional designers. Um, they will not turn you away from publisher content, but they'll talk about some of the stuff that I've talked about, making sure that they sit down and help you understand the content, what's available, what you're going to use. And it, it's great in the sense that if your university has this, uh, please take advantage of them. 
uh, how not to use publishing content as a replacement for your intellectual property. Obviously, if you're a faculty member in this room today, then you've been hired for a purpose because you have something special that you can give back to students. Don't just simply put that in a box and not convey it, but add your intellectual property to publish your content, and that's going to help make your courses a great success. And don't use it for rapid course delivery. Uh, just, as, just as a warning, um, it just doesn't work out real well like that. Uh, it's, you know, there, there may have been something that studies show that it might work, but I can guarantee you firsthand, uh, uh, you know, I've seen it not work. And I've seen it not work in my own department. And it's simply because, you know, it may be great for rapid course delivery, but then if you don't know the content, it just doesn't go hand in hand. And this time I'll turn it back over to Lauren or Misty. Thank you, Brian. That was gr your insight is great. We've got a question that popped up in the chat, and then we're going to break into some demos. So Elizabeth wants to know: Do your instructional designers receive a general admin login ID for the publisher websites through the Blackboard building blocks? Um, how our um, instructional designers work here is they're usually students. Uh, that work that are trained under a main instructional designer. Uh, we're a faculty of 800, and one main instructional designer with uh, a big push that everybody uses Blackboard. So at the beginning of any semester or summer, students are hired and they, they're taught. Then they actually go and sit down with the faculty member, and so the faculty log in, and the student designers work with them and show them around, so that they're not going behind the scenes and doing it. Um, so that way, a faculty can replicate what they've just watched later. Elizabeth, does that help you at all? Elizabeth was saying she is an instructional designer and she has trouble helping the faculty because she can't access the publisher materials. And I see Haley also yeah. has a similar problem. And, and that's exactly why we have the students sit down with them so that uh, they're logged in as the faculty member. But of course, they're sitting right there so that um, so that they get the you know they 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 get to do the walk with them. I guess you could say. Great. Thanks, Brian. And I know that you were hesitant to do your demo of Cengage. Do you want to try it or not? Um, right now, I've got three things popping up with a Java warning. I'm scared if I click anything to share, <laughs> anything else is going to crash. OK, I, that's, totally that's fine. So I'm going to have Misty um, do a quick demo of McGraw. And Wiley, and a quick demo of Explore. So, Misty, if you want to start sharing your screen. Okay, while I'm getting my share set up, if you guys will just give me a green check mark to confirm that my audio is still okay. Thank you so much. And again, a green check mark if you're able to see my Blackboard login screen. I'm sorry, not login. It should say chapter one. It looks like you guys are okay. So I'll go ahead and minimize my chat. Okay, so I'm going to begin um, by showing you some publisher content that I have already added to my course. But before I do that, I want you to be able to see where you may choose the different ways that you can add content. So of course you have your build content menu and I had mentioned to you guys earlier about being able to add in and you can see here a couple of different choices. So here I actually have some Pearson's content and then over here on the right I have the different mashups that I mentioned to you earlier. On my assessments menu you can see um, that I have the ability to create a McGraw-Hill assignment. Now keep in mind, this is going to look a little bit different in terms of your options that you have on your server, depending on what building blocks and what tools you all have installed or licensed in your environment. But typically, this is where you would find these types of things. Finally, under Tools, I have quite a few, but you can see here that I have here over on the right-hand side, I have the Cengage Learning Mind Links tools, and then I have the McGraw-Hill, here's Pearson's, and then finally here at the bottom I also have some of the Wiley Plus content. And then the last menu that I want to show you is your ability, again, here's the Cengage, 
McGraw, Hill, Wiley, and Pearson. So different types of content shows up in different areas um, across here, these different menus that you have uh, in your content areas inside of your course. Hi, Ms. Now, with that said, I want to go in and show you um, an activity that is just conceptual. Let's say that at the beginning of a chapter, so I'm going to go into, uh, I'm already inside of my chapter one material, and let's say that I have asked my students to complete a study module. Now, for the sake of demoing, I've moved all of my study modules here, so I'll just hop over there, but you can, of course, include these wherever you want. So I'm going to go in and access my Chapter 1 study module. You'll notice that right now I'm getting a warning. It's just probably related to my browser because of encryption. It's just asking me, do I want to continue? So I'll say yes. And here we've been pushed over into McGraw-Hill Connect. There's a couple of different things that I can see here. So I have the ability to preview this module as a student. I'll go ahead and do that. There are a couple of different components here. I, I hover my mouse over different areas to gain more information about what it is that I need to do. Once I'm finished looking in this area, I have this nice button that takes me back to the instructor review. And on this page, I have student progress. I have um, the ability to, pre again, preview. I have policies in terms of when do I want this content to be available. Um, what I love about this that I want to highlight is the single sign-on, being able to directly navigate to the study module inside of McGraw-Hill Connect. I also love that this particular tool relies on cognitive mapping, which lets me create an individualized learning path for my students. So I, I just personally think this is a great way for students to be able to experience an introduction to an assignment, which really goes along with some of Brian's um, ways to properly use um, content from publishers. When I'm finished, all I have to do is return to Blackboard and I jump right back inside of Blackboard without having to, again, have multiple tabs here open across the top or different browsers, I'm able to, to see that content directly um, inside of Blackboard. I'll also show you from Wiley. So let me go into my Wiley area, my psych unit. Let me back up one. I'm going to go back into chapter material because I believe my extra credit reading is inside of here. So bear with me while I navigate. You can see I do have a lot of different types of content. So here is my um, extra credit reading. So I can click on that and you'll notice it's very similar to McGraw-Hill. I immediately pop over. Here I'm able to see the content. I'm able to flip through using a, um, the buttons or the, the links here on the right-hand side. I also have navigation that's provided to me here on the right-hand side. And then there are other options that are included, included in this particular resource. So I have a chapter review. I have additional explanation. Um, these are just areas where students may choose to take advantage of other content that is included here that may not necessarily be part of what you wanted them to do. My assignment was just to have them read the content, but they could self-assess with this uh, test that has been provided here. You'll also notice that Wiley includes a printer version. So I'll go ahead and return to Blackboard. Again, it's just one click to get back to where I started. And now let me show you some assignments. Um, being able to search for and embed different types of faculty, publisher, community-generated content is convenient. And I'd already highlighted to you, um, you know, the time that it takes for you to author this content on yourself. So publisher content generally lends itself to give you the option to be able to create and add rich publisher assessments and assignments. So with McGraw-Hill, I can add an assignment directly from the action bar, and I showed you that earlier. So if I go back into my chapter material, 
back into my chapter one, you'll see that I've already created some assignments. So I'm going to pause just a minute in case your screen is refreshing. So here is an intro to biology chapter one assignment. Um, you can see in the description here that this is a matching assignment that's going to reinforce the knowledge that they attained in the study module that they just completed. So let's go ahead and take a look. I really like this particular assignment type. It's an interactive matching assignment. So I'll go ahead and say, yes, I want to move on over. And again, you get different types of information. So I can see that this is past due. I can see who's in progress, who hasn't actually started. Again, I have the ability to preview. And then here is the assignment itself. And I'll just show you how you interact. So basically, it's just a drag and drop experience. Um, your students would have the similar type of experience. You can see that the ones that I've selected are sort of dimmed out, where the choices that are still available to me when I hover my mouse over them, they turn blue. And I think you get the point from here. And so we can even submit the assignment. And somehow I managed to actually get one of those correct. Biology is not my discipline. But nonetheless, um, an enjoyable experience in terms of um, the student's perspective, nice feedback that's provided to them. Um, again, you can see that they have the question score. You can even show the correct answer key, so on and so forth. So, a great experience here. I'll go ahead and close and return to the instructor's view. And then here again, it's easy for me to pop back into Blackboard. I do want you to know that once the student completes the assignment, the grade automatically populates your grade center inside of Blackboard. You are not having to do double work in terms of having grades that you then have to go to your publisher content area and then re-enter those inside of your grade center for your course. So it's automatically populated. One other thing that I want to mention to you about the McGraw-Hill integration specifically is that it allows your students to get to the assignment in one click. And so from their perspective, it's actually going to open up in the Blackboard wrapper, the Blackboard course, if you will. And they may not even realize that they are inside of another application because it's going to be running and embedded inside of the page. And I do want to let you know that McGraw-Hill is one of many partnerships that allow us to represent 95% of all higher education publisher partners. So that, that's good for us. Um, here at Blackboard. I do want to show you also the ability to include a Wiley Plus assignment in the course. So that was my reading. I apologize. Let me go back. It is in my chapter material. Just one second and I will navigate and demo the Wiley assignment. So scrolling down just a bit. All right, here is my critical thinking essay. You'll notice again it's saying that this link is going to take you directly into this assignment and I'm asking them to take their time and being able to thoughtfully answer the question. So I'll go ahead and click the link. Here I am with just an assignment type and you'll notice if I go to the student preview it's providing the same information. So it's a questions, exercises, assignment type. Here I have my start date. Um, my assignment policies, is this going to be graded? Yes, it is. How many attempts do I have? And then I can go ahead and get started. And so here is my first essay question. You can see the writing prompt that I have been given. I can enter my information here into this box, and I do have the ability to make my text entry area larger. When I'm ready to progress to the next question, then I just use that was actually the only question in this particular set. But once I'm finished previewing as a student, I can go back to my instructor view. And essentially, I'm able to see the exact same essay question that I included. I can also navigate here 
And then I have the ability to review any scores, uh, any score information that I may have set up. Again, when I'm done, I can simply go back into Blackboard. And what's equally great about Wiley Plus is grades auto also automatically show up inside of Blackboard. So we've taken some effort to make sure that this is a streamlined process, that it's really easy for you to be able to take advantage of these tools. Um, those are just two examples of ways that you can use publisher content inside of your course. Um, as a review, I also just want to point out to you one more time the ability for you to, from the build content menu, to create um, these different mashups. And I also have, I believe, on this server, a Merlot building block that has been included. Um, so you might want to take a look at that one for your institution. And then I am going to log out because I don't have it under this login. I'm going to log in as a different user and show you the Explore product. Before I do, I think I should probably pause and just make sure that you guys are okay. Hi, Missy. There are there are a few questions that I wanted to get to before we demo explore. Are you able to hear me? Okay, Missy, if you can, the first question is from John. When you were doing that interactive assignment, did that drag is the drag and drop content flash? I am not 100% certain. I will have to double check on that. Being on the McGraw-Hill end, I'm not sure how that particular content is powered. John, we'll try to follow up on our end and we will get back to you. And then there was another one from Daniel. Do students have to pay an access fee on top of the text cost? Um, and Daniel, not sure if there was a specific access fee with one of the publishers she was talking about or just in general. What I have found, and I'm not, you know, deeply familiar with all of the different publisher content, but yes, there are publisher fees that are typically um, packaged. Like it, it, what I have found is that it's typically added to the cost of the text. And so there's no second fee. Um, typically there's a key that's included and the text will be shrink wrapped if it's a printed text and the key will be provided inside. And so the student doesn't see it as a secondary fee because it's included in the cost of the text. Is that what you're looking for? Perfect. Yes, that's what he was looking for. And then Richard had a question about the assignments and if they're accessible on mobile devices or through the Blackboard Mobile Learn app. I am 98% certain that they are accessible through the Blackboard Mobile Learn app. Um, they may render differently, of course. It's not going to look exactly the same as what I just showed you because of the screen real estate that's provided to you on a mobile device. I will confirm that, but like I said, I, I am just almost absolutely positively certain that you access all of those. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to. Actually, I'll take the next question and I'll check my mobile learn app as I'm listening to Lauren give the question. Thanks, Misty. Um, Sandra has a question. Does the instructor enroll the student via the publisher site or is this all done through Blackboard? I would like to double check on that one. I believe it's all going to be done through Blackboard and then when the student has to authenticate, they'll use the key or other, um, other identifying information that's been provided in the text. Thanks, Misty. Um, and for those of you that we're following up on, we will email you directly 
um, with the information that we're still providing up on. Now we're getting close to the top of the hour, so if you have any more questions, please write them in the chat window. And if anyone's able to stay past the hour mark, we can still have Misty give a very short demo of Explore. Um, while a few of you are writing your questions, I also wanted to make two announcements before some of you start to drop off. The first one I wanted to make is about our BB World 2013. Just wanted to let you all know that the early bird rate of $500 is available through the end of the month, which is coming up this week. It will be in Las Vegas July 7th through the 12th. And you can find more information at bbworld.com, and I'll throw that link into the chat. And then I also wanted to let everyone know that our digital content cohort is starting up again next Wednesday. I put the link in earlier. I will also put this back in. This is a deeper dive, a six-week dive into several types of digital content, including publisher content and a much more in-depth view into several of our publisher partners. Also, we will go into talking about open education resources, other content generated resources, and we will also focus on Explore, which Misty is going to demo in a few minutes for one of our sessions. So if you'd like to sign up, it is open to all educators who are primarily in higher ed in North America is our focus because of the publisher partnership sessions. So those of you who are in higher ed, will get the most out of it in North America. So I'll post that link into the chat. Um, and I don't see any of don't see any questions, Misty, so you're free to dry, go into your demo of Explore.